Well, um, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good morning uh, from the Asia Society, whatever part of the world you are joining us uh, from. Um, it's uh, good to have you all with us because we have a special guest, a, a real live New Yorker, um, a member of the United States Congress, um, and um, importantly for all of us, a chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And I speak uh, none other uh, of uh, Congressman uh, Gregory Meeks. Um, the Congress, uh, Congressman Meeks has been in the United States Congress uh, for a long time. He is now a serving member uh, of the House Finance Committee. Uh, he is a senior member of that committee. Um, and most recently has been appointed uh, chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He is the first African-American, I'm advised, to hold that position. Um, we are delighted to have um, the chair with us today, um, not least because um, he, as I said before, is a bona fide New Yorker. Uh, his congressional district um, lies uh, uh, in and around Queens. Um, JFK, the airport, uh, lies um, in the heart of the, um, of the congressman's uh, district. And so he knows very much the concerns of New Yorkers as well. Uh, but he joins us today very much as a member of the um, United States uh, legislature, uh, and importantly, as someone who has been part and parcel of the process of navigating through the United States uh, Congress, uh, what has been just introduced and called the Eagle Act. And the Eagle Act has been called a number of things um, in the lead up to its final introduction title. Um, the um, Eagle Act has been variously referred to as the China Act. Uh, it has been variously referred to as the uh, US uh, uh, Strengthening uh, America Act. It has been variously referred to elsewhere uh, as the Strategic uh, Competition and Engagement Act. But the official title as of today uh, is the Eagle Act. And as I understand it, uh, its subtitle is the Ensuring American Global Leadership and Engagement Act. Um, and if you look at uh, the acronym, Ensuring American Global Leadership and Engagement Act, the EGLE Act, that's how uh, we've arrived at uh, this great, iconic, uh, totemic uh, American bird, uh, the eagle. And so we are all ears today to hear what uh, uh, Chairman Meeks has to say about the content of uh, this legislation, um, it's likely passage uh, through uh, the uh, United States uh, uh, Congress, um, both the House and the Senate, uh, as well as um, what he believes it means for the Biden administration and for America's global standing. Uh, Chairman Mix, apart from all of that, is a member of the Allen AME Church in St Albans, uh, New York, proud member of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Uh, as a huge sports fan, uh, Chairman Meeks enjoys watching the New York Knicks, New York Giants, uh, and the New York Mets. And he's married to Simone Marie Mix, uh, and they have three daughters, Ebony, Aja, and Nia Ayana. So, um, Chairman um, Meeks, you are a welcome guest among us at the Asia Society today. Uh, we look forward very much to your remarks. Over to you, Chairman. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. You know, just listening to it, it reminds me I've got to add uh, something to it because I uh, recently on April 1st had my second granddaughter. So I have two grandchildren now and I've got to add them to that because they mean so much. One was running around, one uh, is two years old and the other, as I said, was just born a few months ago. So I've got to add London, that's uh, her, my oldest grandchild's name and, and uh, Jayla. So uh, you just reminded, I got to tell my staff, we got to add that to the... <laughs> 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 it's important. I've got two grandkids too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, let me, let me uh, give my sincere thanks to the Asia Society and the Asia Society Policy Institute for uh, inviting me and hosting me today. Um, you know, as you've indicated, and we've talked earlier, I know there's people from around the world, but being a lifelong New Yorker, you know, I say New York is the city and the, the, the so great, they had to name it twice, New York, New York. So, you know, I wish, you know, we were doing this in person from the Asia Society's offices on the Upper East Side. But uh, nevertheless, because of technology, and it looks like it is in fact working, I'm glad to be with you today. <laughs> uh, you know, 
I, I want to start by uh, commending the Asia Society for building bridges between the United States and Asia through its work on policy and arts and culture. That work, in my estimation, is critical in the aftermath of the Second World War when the society was founded. And I believe it is just as, if not more essential today. So I'm here today to talk about China and how to confront the challenges its policies pose to the United States and the American-led rules-based international order which has yielded decades of growing prosperity and relative peace in Asia and the wider world. Now, it saddens me to say that this order is more tenuous today than it has been in years. And of course, a significant reason why it is, is China. As the country has grown in economic heft, its government has unfortunately used its newfound influence and power in ways that run contrary to the interests of others in the region and class with the very international order which facilitated its rise. We are all aware of these challenges. They range from the PRC's aggressively pressing its border, maritime and territorial claims to its economic coercion against US allies. It includes the PRC's theft of intellectual property and technology and its anti-competitive industrial and trade policies that have for years put American companies and workers at a disadvantage. It also includes attempts by the PRC to mold regional and international institutions in ways that undermine a rules-based order, erode the market principles of non-discrimination, market access, repress, represent, re, 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 reciprocity, excuse me, fairness and transparency, and apply undue influence on sovereign states. Now, I am very disturbed when the PRC government abrogated its commitments to the one country, two systems principle in Hong Kong. It did so with draconian national security law and I'm deeply concerned by the continued attacks on the freedoms and the rights of the people of Hong Kong. The world has watched in horror as the government of China has committed atrocities against the Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang building high-tech surveillance and censorship tools that has no compunction in exporting abroad. And I could go on, but there is no shortage of people diagnosing the problems. We know the challenges. The real question is how we respond to them. As we answer this critical question, we must consider the environment that has enabled the PRC to act in the manner it does. We have to be frank about the fact that part of the reason is that we have allowed American leadership and American engagement globally to slip by the wayside. Instead of supporting and trusting our allies and partners, we have been alienating them. And we have stopped investing in American institutions, innovation, and the American worker, raising doubts among our friends about America's resilience. The United States became complacent, not by supporting China's raise, rise, but by taking our foot off the pedal when it comes to bolstering the international order and our alliance system. The last administration forgot that if we don't lead that order, someone else will take advantage of our absence. The fact of the matter is the PRC loves a vacuum and it knows how to fill it. Going forward, we will need more than tough talk and bluster about China. It will require leveraging America's true strengths and focusing on the real challenges posed by the PRC. America will come out ahead as long as we lead with confidence and abide by a few core principles. The first of which is we have to show up. That means doing the hard work of diplomacy in the region and in the regional and multilateral institutions where China has increasingly gotten a foothold. Second, we have to be clear eyed about what our interests are and steadfast in their defense. 
This cannot be an effort to counter everything China does around the world. We cannot let the PRC dictate US policy and or strategy. Third, we have to exercise leadership on the foundations of our core values. That means not being afraid to call out human rights violations in China and leading on the principal transnational challenges of our time, including climate change. Fourth, having just gone through two of the longest wars in American history, America must work to prevent what many refer to as an avoidable war with China. This requires a keep open lines of communication and dialogue with China and put in place crises avoidance and management procedures to reduce the risk of accidents and unwanted conflict. Our goal is constructive competition, not conflict. And last but not least, I believe that it's absolutely critical that we do not go it alone. America's greatest superpower in the global arena is our alliances. And we must reinvigorate that system and reassure our alliances and partners, not just with words, but through action. Now, I have been delighted to see the approach that the Biden administration has taken towards the Indo-Pacific. Just last week, I met with President Moon of South Korea, who was in Washington for a summit with the president. President Biden's first official summit was with Japan. Secretary Blinken and Austin's trips to Japan and Korea, and Secretary Austin's separate trip to India, so early in the new administration, reinforced America's role as a Pacific power and signaled to China and the world that the United States is back in the arena with our allies and partners alongside us. But in my conversation with our allies and partners, I must admit, I do hear doubts about whether the United States will stay the course. After the tenure of the previous administration and the insurrection in Washington on January 6, there is a fear that the next administration could undo the commitments made by this one. And that's why it is very important that Congress act. Congress must. And as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I will make sure that we remain steadfast in our focus to renew American institutions and competitiveness at home and American engagement and leadership abroad. The right path is one that is shaped by the lessons from our past and guided by a positive vision for the future. A free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific and a peaceful, prosperous world governed by international rules. So today I'm proud to be introducing comprehensive legislation to accomplish those objectives. And as Kevin said, it is the Ensuring American Global Leadership and Engagement Act, or EGLE. We bolster, the EGLE Act will bolster US leadership and investments in Indo-Pacific region and globally in response to the China challenge. So first, to accomplish the critical task of bolstering our diplomacy, the EGLE Act authorizes an increase in the Department of State personnel and resources devoted to the Indo-Pacific and, pre and presents regional blueprints to enhance American engagement. It emphasizes the power of multilateralism Focusing on, focusing on boosting American leadership and international organizations, such as the United Nations, as well as regional ones like APIC. And it stresses the need to strengthen the bonds with our partners and allies across the Pacific and the Atlantic through bilateral and trilateral engagement, as well as, well as through the quadrilateral dialogue. Second, the Eagle Act presents a proactive agenda for the Indo-Pacific and the international system based on open commerce and the rule of law. It shines a light on many of the countries typically ignored by American foreign policy, including the Pacific Island states, states in the Caribbean, and on the continent of Africa. 
These countries are often at the front line of international and transnational threats and are especially vulnerable because of the lack of international infrastructure, tech, technological and cyber related standards. They are looking for US leadership in strengthening a rules based order. And this act positions the United States government to do just that. Third, the United States must be at the forefront in tackling global issues like climate change, global health, and nuclear security. The EGLE Act spurs US strategic and economic competitiveness, competitiveness through climate action, vaccine diplomacy, development finance, and support. It recognizes we cannot solve these problems alone and that China has to be also a part of the solution. We have to ensure that we hold China, the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, accountable on climate and that China plays a constructive role on nuclear security. Fourth, the Eagle Act ensures that the United States leads with its values. This bill takes concrete steps to respond to the PRC's human rights violations by imposing costs on China for its use of Uyghur forced labor and providing temporary protected status and refugee status for qualifying Hong Kongers. And finally, the bill aims to strengthen America's economic diplomacy and statecraft. We will only be able to restore America's global leadership to its rightful place if we shape the economic rules that govern global commerce, empower American workers and businesses, and invest in the technologies of the future. The Eagle Act calls on the administration to negotiate digital trade agreements, bolster US economic engagement with key partners like ASEAN, enhance transparency around US financial markets, and boost US assistance and financing as an alternative to China. So no matter what China does, America has a clear task ahead of it. Diplomacy has to be the cornerstone of how we go forward. Our military might is second to none, but we must invest in our institutions and most importantly, our international alliances because these are the true sources of our unique and enduring strength. You know, I've said it before, and I'll say it again as I conclude, we can no longer be America first. We must be America forward with our friends and allies to make this place that we call Earth a better place. So thank you so very much. And I look forward to engaging with Wendy on questions well, thank you so much, Chairman Meeks. Um, you put a lot of um, issues on the table, so I think we have a lot to get to. Um, and thanks for um, sharing with us kind of your views on China, the region, and how the US should engage and respond. Um, before we start our conversation, I just wanted to let our viewers know that we will take questions from you as well. If you can put your questions in the chat function in YouTube or Facebook, or email them to us at moderator at asiasociety, one word, dot org. We'll try and get to those questions as well. But Chairman Meeks, let, let's, let's start. I, I noted that, you re, that in your remarks, you really emphasize, um, I think the term was constructive um, cooperation with China and diplomacy. And the Biden administration, has, when it talks about China, it talks about competition, it talks about confrontation, but it also talks about cooperation. Can you tell us a little more about cooperation? Where can we cooperate with China? And is that realistic given tensions in our relationship as well as the growing anti-China sentiment in Congress and around the country? Yeah, I think we can. And I believe that President Biden has really a, um, adopted what I would call a pragmatic framework. Uh, and, and I think that it's important to note that 
President Biden and the Biden administration sees China not as an adversary, but as a competitor. And that's tremendously important. So why we must be clear eyed about the challenges that the, the PRC policies pose to the United States, it's why I think that we need a uh, whole of government approach to effectively uh, buttress American power to face up to the China challenge. So, you know, I talk about us not being silent when the PRC commits uh, what I believe is a genocide in Xinjiang or where it threatens our core interests or our partners and allies. Uh, so there will, you know, there's definitely going to be times where we have to stand up to Beijing. There are many no aspects of the relationship where we're going to be competing strenuously and there's going to be a key component of dealing with the competition from China so that we can show and reassert our uh, global leadership. But what you're asking is at the same time, we must work hard to reduce the risk of any conflict and strengthen the incentives for China to work within. I think that's the key to get China to work within the rules-based international order. And, you know, and we don't simply do this for China's sake. We do it because of so many of the global challenges that we face today. It can't be resolved unless China is also there and part of the solution. Climate change. We've got to come to agreements on climate change. That's the ultimate example. Right now, China is the world's greatest emitter of greenhouse gases, for example. And we'd lose all if we do not hold China accountable and talk to them and have them work with us so that we can sure that be sure that we bend the emissions curve. So cooperation, in my estimation, has to be part of the formula. And you know, what I tell some of my colleagues in the House who are more hawkish, we're not doing that or playing nice but it's in America's interest. And I think that the American people understand that it's in our interest uh, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about you know, working, for example, with nuclear, con nuclear control and the JCPOA. Uh, there's a number of issues that we've got to work with China. And I think that we'll have that dialogue and conversation. I think that the Biden administration is, is, is being very pragmatic about how to do it. I think one area where um, there's increasing concern is um, Taiwan and the potential for conflict in the Taiwan Straits. How concerned are you about um, conflict in the Straits? What can we do to avoid it? Is there anything in the Eagle Act that addresses strengthening our relationship with Taiwan and trying to avoid any type of open conflict in the Taiwan Strait? Yeah, you know, the United States will stand with our allies and partners. I mean, that's, that, that's one thing that we've got to let them know. We will stand with you. And of course, that includes our longstanding ties with uh, our democratic friend, Taiwan. Um, and we will make sure that we continue to honor our commitments as outlined in the three communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act and the six assurances. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that uh, the Biden administration has uh, taken that right approach, uh, continuing the arms sales and high level contacts with the Taiwanese officials. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of growing concerns about China what they may or may not do. And I think that what we need to do is to be clear that our ultimate objective is to ensure the freedom and the safety of the Taiwanese people uh, through the maintenance of peace and stability across the, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but what we must continue to look for is ways to deepen and strengthen the connections with Taiwan. For this reason, we put in the Eagle Act uh, measures to establish a program to provide a two-year fellowship, for example, in Taiwan to qualify U.S. government employees. And we have a going back and forth 
uh, with them and that that's in. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, uh, Taiwan uh, can defend itself. So we must help Taiwan maintain a sufficient self-defense capability and some of that we've included in this act also. Um, um, and it also means of course, that uh, the way to calibrate our policy uh, and diplomacy so that we can deter any military action by Beijing. And I think that's what comes first. We have to be clear that our ultimate objective is to ensure those freedoms and safety and deal with it through a diplomatic way and not a military way. And we make those emphasis uh, within the bill, within the Eagle Act. Good. You know, you also have been emphasizing the importance of working closely with our allies and partners. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that is extremely important. But based on my experience, it can be kind of difficult. We don't see eye to eye on every issue with our allies and partners. So how would, um, how do you see working with our allies and partners? How can we respect the differences we may have with them on certain aspects um, of our relationship, but yet you know, work on a united and collective front, particularly when it comes to addressing the challenges that China's bringing to the global order. You know, what we have to do is to be aware of each other's issues. And we've got to listen and talk to one another. And that, that's why I'm not part of the America only in America first uh, uh, positions of the private administration, not considering others. And when we talk about a rules-based system that supports our values, those are the things that locks us in. So if we're focused on a rules-based system that, that, that represents our values, then we can have an open discussion and dialogue to get to where we need to get to that can help one another. I use an example that we did not do in the United States that I was very much in favor of, uh, but unfortunately we didn't get it done. And I still wish and think that we've got to find a way to do it. TPP, here is something that was extremely important, not domestically, not just domestically, but with reference to getting China to play by rules and working with our allies and friends to create standards that all of us could agree with that then prevents anybody from slipping through the cracks. It's, um, you know, you never expect to have 100% uh, agreement with a partner. You know, my wife says all the time, she doesn't agree with me on everything, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a discussion and dialogue to try to work through those issues that we differ on. And I think this is the way that we do it. And I think that we understand with our friends and allies that we all share certain things in common and there's a give and take in those negotiations where everybody's main considerations are, uh, are thought about. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is the way that I think that we can move forward. And, that's, and I think that's been the strength of America uh, leading uh, prior to uh, the last administration bringing folks together. That's real leadership. Um, you mentioned TPP. And after we left, the 11 other countries banded together and put that agreement into place without us. Now, many of us tell us publicly and privately that they would love to see us return to that agreement. Um, I, for one, don't think that's in the cards. In the immediate term, I'd be interested if, if you would share that view. But what, what I'd be interested is what can we do short of TPP to re-engage economically in the Indo-Pacific region? I think you had mentioned earlier in the Eagle Act, for example, there was something on, on um, promoting um, an agreement on digital trade, um, but I'd be interested, what can we do short of TPP? Well, um... I think that uh, just what we're talking, we still must uh, excel by proactively engaging our allies and partners on trade issues and ensure that trade agreements, as I said, are 
equitable and transparent. I know the agreements that have already been uh, engaged into in the region in our absence. I think that the United States, uh, again, needs to find creative ways to ramp up our economic diplomacy. This means uh, ensuring that, for example, that critical supply chains are secure, that our businesses and competitive uh, uh, are competitive globally, that the United States uh, is a leader in, at, at economic for forums like APEC, and that we're negotiating limited sectorial agreements on critical emerging areas like digital trade. We can get involved there. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, and you're right, I don't think that we're there yet with TPP, but I think that we have to have a conversation with the American people where we talk about trade in a more holistic way. You know, as I said, you know, people tend to focus on economic aspects of trade, but often overlook the, significant, the strategic and values components. So being at the forefront of the global trade agenda has yielded substantial benefits to our prosperity and our security for decades. And so today with uh, China on the rise, it is essential that we rest back that leadership role, that we talk to the American people about it, not just when there's a trade agreement up, but we need to talk to them about it now and consistently. And I think that then will change the tide. And, uh, and though we may not be in TPP immediately, uh, immediately, it will still help us with the trade agenda and working in a collective way with our allies. Mentioned in, in your opening comments, um, I think you used the term vaccine diplomacy, and that the U.S. I assume what you're saying we need to get in into the vaccine um, game in in a more robust way. Just this past couple of weeks, the the Biden administration has announced um, that we'll be shipping. I, th I think it's 80 million um, vaccines globally by the end of June. Is that enough? Should we be doing more? And are you worried that China um, is energetically and enthusiastically sharing lots of vaccines in all places in the world, trying to kind of build goodwill that may work against the United States? Well, we do have to do more. You know, given that this pandemic is a global problem, uh, and we know it can only be solved by leveraging a global response and global cooperation. So we must act absolutely do more to help others around the world. There's no question about that. I don't think that reality is lost on the Biden administration. You know, and I know what he's doing now and I applaud him for trying to coordinate a multilateral effort to help other countries uh, come out of this pandemic. I do think it was important and significant that he announced that the United States will donate 80 million vaccines by the end of June. And I think that President Biden has also demonstrated that uh, none of us are safe until we are all safe. Um, so I, I, you know, look, we've got to do more. I think that there's the, the pledge that he has made on top of the commitment uh, was when he had the meeting with the Quad Leaders meeting to advance the cooperation among Quad Nations. I think that was in responding to the COVID-19 and talking about financing 1 billion vaccines in the Indo-Pacific region, for example, by the end of 2022. And, you know, we can see given the challenges India is now facing, and I believe that the other Quad Nations should redouble their efforts to meet that goal too. But again, that's why the Eagle Act um, authorizes the department, the development, excuse me, of finance corporation to uh, provide financing to entities in India and in other countries so that we can increase the manufacturing capacity, not just for the vaccines, but also for the critical raw materials that are necessary, you know, the medical supplies such as therapeutics and ventilators and PPE and oxygen and diagnosis. So I think that's what we need to do, but do we need to do more? All of us need to do more. Um, this is a global pandemic and it knows no boundaries. Yeah. 
Um, let me now turn to some questions from our audience. Um, we have a question just asking about um, the appointment of ambassadors in the Indo-Pacific region, and in particular, whether you think it's important that we, we appoint an ASEAN ambassador, a position that was left vacant during the Trump administration. And could you comment a little more on, I think your bill you'd mentioned is gonna kind of build the ranks and give more money to the State Department to really build up the career foreign service why is that important and what is the act seeking to accomplish? Yeah, it's stressing the importance of the State Department, number one. Uh, I believe that the State Department has not received the, 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 the attention uh, from the American people and from Congress that it should. You know, the military always receives attention and the funding that it needs. If you look at the State Department, it's generally underfunded and what we're going to uh, emphasize is the, necess the necessity to fund the State Department to its fullest, particularly in the Indo-Pacific areas, uh, so that we can have diplomacy and diplomats on the ground talking about the issues that are important to our allies and us. So yes, we should feel, uh, and I would hope uh, that the uh, president uh, fills those uh, ambassadorships in a very timely fashion, and the Senate works on uh, approving them in a very timely fashion. Uh, not having ambassadors on the ground and in the ASEAN, ASEAN uh, 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 as an ambassador to the ASEAN countries is a tremendous mistake. Uh, we need it, and we need it like yesterday. Uh, I had the conversation uh, with a few folks in the administration, Secretary uh, Blinken and uh, and, and Jake Sullivan, uh, along with the vice president. Uh, and I've got every indication and every belief that they understand that and they'll be moving in that direction. So um, it is diplomacy uh, is tremendously important that we put that foot forward uh, and make sure that it's loud and clear. Yeah, that, that is important. We have another question and just wanting to first commend you on the comments you made on the importance of human rights in our relationship with China and emphasizing the importance, even if China doesn't want to hear it. Um, does the Eagle Act, the question is, does the Eagle Act contain a, you know, specific um, provisions with respect to um, dealing with human rights abuses, including sanctions? Well, yes. It does, and we you know we'll look at sanctions. But I, I'll say this: it is very important to me. Uh, Kevin said at the onset of uh, my introduction that I'm the first African American to chair this prestigious committee. I don't come from and, and, uh, and arrive at that from a vacuum. I arrive at it from human rights violations here in the United States of America. I arrived from it from a background of watching my parents grow up in a segregated Jim Crow South where human rights violations occurred all the time. I arrived at it at remembering traveling to the South and seeing signs that said white only and colored and the deplorable conditions in which those who happened to look like me had to go to whether it's schools or healthcare, et cetera. So it's embedded in me that we can't stand by and be quiet when we see human rights violations by China or anyone else for that matter. And so, yes, we made sure that there's provisions and talked about human rights in the Eagle Act. And I'm gonna make sure that we talk about it all the time as chairman of this committee. Now, I think that the United States has proved that if it's focused on and good people start speaking up, we can make some changes. We can move forward. For America is much better now than it was at that time, even though we still have challenges today, as we've seen going over the past year. So I'm not going at it to tell China that we're better than them just because of we, we I'm going to China to tell China we know human rights violations when we see it. And we're going to stand together to change it. Because if there's one thing that we all have in common, is that we're part of the same race. 
the human race. And we got to stand there by for human rights to make sure that we don't suffer at the hand of brutality and racism and bigotry. It cannot stand. We will make sure we're focused on the committee. And yes, the Eagle Act does deal with it. The powerful words. Let me just ask just one final question. Um, as chairman of um, such an important committee, which is such an impact on, on our global relations and bilateral relations with so many countries, um, when you look at the Indo-Pacific world, the Indo-Pacific region, what specifically would you like to do besides, you know, pass legislation? Um, you know, they, you mentioned in your opening remarks that showing up is important. You, you, you know, once COVID lifts, do you see yourself, you know, visiting the region, um, attending some of these summit meetings? And are there other ways that you as chairman um, and your committee under your leadership plan to engage more in this dynamic and critical region? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I was looking to go uh, in June to the conference in Singapore uh, in Shangri-La. The Shangri-La Dialogue. Yeah. Shangri-La Dialogue. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, I know it has been canceled and we were looking at it. So uh, I do have plans to, to come to the, the region soon. I've traveled to the region a lot prior to being chair, uh, be it Japan, South Korea, um, uh, uh, Singapore, you know, uh, Japan, uh, I, I, so I look to do it in a official capacity. I look at the members that we have on the subcommittee and Chairman uh, Ami Berra, who have a genuine interest and ready to go and ready to move uh, uh, the subcommittee uh, forward. And, and, and I have told him and we look on the full committee to work with him uh, to make sure that Congress uh, has a president. I met with uh, President Moon, as I said, uh, just a couple of days ago. And what we talked about was the importance of having uh, contact legislative body with legislative body in each of the uh, quad countries and the countries uh, in the area, that that is significant and important. So we look to have uh, those relationships and talk to our uh, colleagues in the various legislative bodies and create relationships uh, with them uh, as we move forward. So um, um, I'm very uh, focused on making sure that uh, the, 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 the United States Congress, not just the executive branch, uh, is very focused and have a real presence uh, in the region uh, and makes a difference uh, in that regard. So I think that once we get to know some of our colleagues, uh, we travel there, they travel to the United States. Um, I, I told uh, um, the, the prime minister that, you know, we're ready to go down under um, and, and visit uh, Australia. I'm looking forward to doing that again. Uh, we think it's tremendously important. Uh, and, I, and I didn't stress enough uh, how significant uh, I think that the Quad is. Uh, that was, it is very important. Uh, I had a meeting with the ambassadors, uh, of course, of the Quad Nations. We had a dinner together. And the conversation, and, and, and I should say on this, you know, also, it wasn't just Democrats. It was a bipartisan engagement, Democrats and Republicans uh, together. I think these are things that we can agree upon uh, to, to, to move forward. And the work that the Quad uh, countries will be able to put together, um, I, I think, is, is going to be significant. And maybe even talk about broadening that and including others. Uh, we broke, we, that question was uh, brokered to President Moon also, with whether he would consider uh, increasing uh, and joining the Quad countries to, to, you know, um, so that we would have to change uh, of course, the number they're in. So uh, yes, expect me uh, and the members of our committee to be very engaged in the region. That's, I think, music to the ears of many um, in the region um, and in the Asia Society and around the country. I think an activist um, Congress um, can really help push our agenda along with the administration. So with that, um, our time is um, winding down. I'm going to turn to my colleague, Danny Russell, a former long-term state um, employee 
career employee who um, I'm sure is going to welcome the news of how much um, of, of the increased funds you'd like to direct to the State Department. Danny? Well, Mr. Chairman, thanks uh, so much for your remarks, uh, including your inspirational points about human rights, uh, and also more broadly, your explanation of the Eagle Act, which is helpful. Uh, you know, I'm particularly struck by your emphasis on the importance of showing up, uh, the importance of showing respect for our allies and for our partners, uh, and you know, the need to be steadfast in our defense of, of universal values, uh, but also of our own interests. And, and also the importance of maintaining dialogue and building up areas of cooperation with China. Um, so I, I think those are all really very important. And uh, as Wendy mentioned, increasing the resources that we devote to diplomacy is a critically important step. Uh, and I commend you for, for that in, in the bill. And um, you know, I am speaking as somebody who's had more than 30 years of experience as a, uh, an American diplomat. In fact, my very first boss in the Foreign Service was Mike Mansfield, who spent 10 years in the House uh, and then 24 years in the Senate. And I'll tell you, he, he's the greatest diplomat and you know, maybe the greatest person that I've ever known. Uh, and he taught me, I think, the greatest skill that a diplomat can acquire, which is how to shut up and listen to the other guy. <laughs> uh, so, and, you know, there's another lesson that I learned in, in my career that you touched on, uh, which is that America's superpower uh, is really our diversity, which gives us an incredible advantage. Uh, it means that, you know, when we feel the team of diplomats and, and the embassy anywhere in the world, that team's going to look at an issue from more than just one point of view. Uh, that team's going to be able to see things that someone else operating alone or from a single viewpoint would have missed. Uh, and listening to you today really brought home to me that you exemplify you know, those assets because your experience as a representative of the people uh, somebody who's in touch with what people really care about uh, and the perspective that you bring to world affairs, as you've described, is so directly shaped by your personal history and, and your background. Uh, that matters a lot. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't mean to flatter you, um, but I, I do think that we're lucky uh, to have you as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I'll tell you, um, you know, the more hearings and meetings that you hold, uh, certainly the more CODELs to the Asia Pacific region that, that you can lead, uh, the more foreign officials like President Moon of Korea that you can host, it's definitely the better for our country and for the world. So uh, I sincerely thank you for what you're doing and I thank you in particular for uh, joining us uh, at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Um, your punishment is that we're going to try to get you back with us again in the not too distant future. Uh, and we want to continue to, to hear from you. So Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, your punishment will be, we will be calling you continuously for your thoughts and advice uh, and maybe recommendations for witnesses, even calling on some of you to be witnesses at our committee hearings. So be careful what you wish for, because you just may get it. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, uh, well, with that, uh, we'll say again, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.